Joining us now is Oji Okwe, with stories treading around the world. Great to have you, Oji. How's it going? How Good morning, uh, Dr. Rufai. <laughs> <laughs> How are you this morning? Oji. Yes? I don't go green here. Oh, yes, my, I don't go green here. How are you? And then guess who we have here? Vim, Vim, Good morning, Vim, our favorite Nigerian wife. Thank you. <laughs> Vim, Vim. Vim, Ma, it's so Vim, nice to have you on set with to us today. Here. How are you this morning? I'm fantastic. Good. I can't wait to hear all you have to say on what's trending today. I am the day. How are Good morning, I'm good. Guess Thanks. what now? Rufai has three, blessed with three mm. women on the morning show. How, how lucky, how lucky is he? They say to you, they say, um, Balogun la, la, me, Oberi. Balogun la, you know, you know, on the weekend yeah, shows, you know, he on the him, weekend yeah. shows on Sundays, it's almost like this. You know, oh, so Steve yeah, and Yori, now true. we call him Steve and his angel. So Rufai, oh, and he's all blessed well. with all your angels yeah. this morning. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> All right, well, good morning to you viewers. Let's begin what's trending. On Monday, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu attended the second term inauguration of Governor Hope Uzodima in Imo State, where he assured Nigerians that he shares in the pains associated with the removal of fuel subsidy. The president also admonished those he says have been responsible for stealing Nigeria's commonwealth in the past 40 years in the name of subsidy. Among you, your families are pregnant people. The day of birth is the day of pain. You go through the labor pain. When you see or you hear the voice of the baby, your pains are gone and you are relieved. Nigeria is a teach. The last 40 years, some very few people were cornering our commonwealth, calling it subsidy. I call it wasteful and different. But right now, we are going through the pain. We are sharing that pain. But today, we are inaugurating a man's second term, a renewed hope. Ah. And that is why I am here. Yes, sir. We love you. We love you. To guarantee you the hope that things are looking up. Things are getting better. And then we get greater and better for the common good of the Nigerian public. I guess all we have is hope, we keep hope alive. I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, where the president is getting some of his rhetoric from. I mean, you guys took a story. Today, inflation rate is up at 28.9%. Well, the president also assured Nigerians not to be bothered about the mass exodus of skilled workers from the country, assuring citizens that the federal government, in collaboration with subnationals, will train more persons to fill the professional gap. Don't worry about what you are hearing about the Japa syndrome. We will train more people. And then we can supply them safe. I'm glad we are showing a very united country and moving forward. The peace that you are enjoying here relatively will be better. And we will work hard with you to achieve that peace. Before now, Every one of us 
is enveloped with fear. So come to Imo State. Today, Imo is safe, are happy, and ready for business. We all right, Ayo, a lot of assurances there. I mean, now we are hearing that Imo State is safer. And, you know, he also kind of brought that rhetoric, Hopu Zodima brought on, I believe, during his campaign where he talked about even training uh, 4,000 youth yes, in Imo State. And he's going to, you know, find a way to give them jobs abroad. This was back in September. Let me just take that video. Uh, this is uh, Hopu Zodima during his campaign rally in September ahead of the governorship election in the state. He had promised to empower 4,000 youth in the state with employment abroad. And by December this year, 4,000 Imo youth will be employed in Iro. Now, the president and Hopu Zodima speaking the same language. Uh, the president has said, you know, don't worry about the Jackpa syndrome, syndrome, that is the mass youth exodus. And now uh, we, are, we don't know if those 4,000 people have been sent abroad by uh, Governor Hopu Zodima. Well, according to the Commissioner of Information in Imo State, when we had him last week, he said we misinterpreted. Oh, the okay. intentions and the, and the statements made by the governor. He said he meant that he wanted to train 4,000 Imo youths to be employable, such that when they go abroad, they would get jobs. Not that he was going to. Um, oh. So, you know, the thing we now need, there will be speeches and there will be interpretation of it. But we will watch what he said. He said he was going to, and they all, there was jubilation that the, pre, the governor was going to give 4,000 young people in Imo State jobs in Europe. By the way, the president also, by his statement, has also said Nigeria has now introduced a new export uh, material, and that is human, by exporting our people. We train them for the outside world. We keep retraining them so that we can, they can continue to jack back and not recognizing or admitting the fact that because we are failing the young people in our nation, they have no choice but to leave their homes to go abroad and work menial jobs in some sense just to make ends meet. And we are proud of that. We shouldn't be. It reminds me of what the former Minister of Labor and Employment, um, Mr. Chris Ngege, said with the doctors, ex mass exodus of doctors, that, oh, if they let them go, we have many doctors. And look at the crisis we have on our hands in the health sector, where we don't have enough doctors to meet the needs of patients in our hospitals. Rhetorics like this, even though it might seem like, oh, he's trying to make a bad situation look good, and as leader, he wants to position well, do more harm than good. Yes. We don't solve problems by burying our head in the sand. And making statements that seem as if things are good, we are just all hallucinating. There's a word for that, it's gaslighting. Saying that what is not is, for instance, the number of things I'll mention in the speech he made, yes. the first is that he said that the economy or the things have gotten better. Has the president been briefed on the recent inflation figures? Has he been briefed on the current exchange rate of the Naira to the dollar? Has he been briefed on food inflation and the fact that people cannot afford to eat? Has he been briefed on the insecurity situation that happened just in his backyard in Abuja and also across the, in Benue State, in other parts, in, in Joss, we we're just talking about just the other day. Has he been briefed? Because it, it, begs to, it begs belief as to how he is judging that things are getting better. Mm -hmm. An acknowledgement and ad, an admittance of the reality of things on ground is not an admittance of failure. Yes. What you then do as leader is to end it on a note of hope. I mean, we're on, in the renewed hope agenda, um, 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 you know, tenure. A note of hope that I understand, and he said it at the beginning, you know, I pay um, pangs of childbirth, etc., which has been part of his campaign from time, even up until, or when he removed fuel subsidy, mm -hmm. up until now. But an acknowledgement of a situation is a sign of empathy as well. Yes. And it shows that the people can trust you because you acknowledge that, there's, that we have a problem on our hands, but as leader, I will fix it. That's what Nigerians want to hear. Absolutely. Not whitewashing, almost, you know, or painting a bad situation as okay and not okay, and, and, and that's normal. The other thing he said was that Imo State was safe. Oji, speak to the Imo people. It's still described as a hotbed of violence. 
And so this coming out, I don't know if it's now a technique where the governor and the president are saying so that just to um, pre present that front. His but name it's on. Yeah. yeah, Governor Hope was Odima. His name is Hope. It's on. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I get you. I, and He's, he, he reiterated that. No, he, there's a thin line between hope and falsehood. Yes. I hope we know that. So Absolutely. the truth is that you can tell us that we have a problem on our hands, but we'll fix it. That's right. what we want to hear. Don't whitewash. It insults the number of lives that of people that were killed or have died in this situation by making it seem as if it does doesn't matter. Things are good. We want things to be better. Let's not even talk about the fact that the president went here when things were happening in Abuja. That's another conversation. That's, a, that's another discussion. But uh, Rufai, uh, just on a lighter note, uh, before I come to you, the president uh, um, and uh, former president Olusha Basanjo were all smiles at the inauguration ceremony on Monday in a picture that has now gone viral. We see that both politicians put their differences aside as they exchange pleasantries. Obasanjo has been a strong critic of the emergence of President Tinubu and even campaigned against him during the 2023 presidential election. Uh, Rufai, we are seeing these two opposition leaders, you know, come together and smile. I mean, I guess uh, Hopu Zobirima was able to get them together. But that picture sends a, a large message. What do you make of that and what do you think it uh, connotes as well? So, um, Audrey, I don't have a proper degree in reading facial expressions, so I will not speak much. But if you ask people, they'll tell you that that picture is pregnant. And that was not a smile. Mm -hmm. It was more like a smirk on the face of Alicia Gwabasanjo. Mm -hmm. And if you had watched that event till the end, you would notice that President Tinubu was still speaking when Alicia Gwabasanjo walked out of the event and he said, bye-bye, uh, baba or something. So that happened mm. while President Tinubu was still speaking. Yeah. So that's more like a smirk. It's not a smile. It's not a smile of acceptance. We all know that these people have their score. I don't think it's all over. What are they trying to spin it? Secondly, I think for advice, mm. the president should not be allowed to speak extemporaneously. Mm. His advisor should always prepare him a script. Because you see, anytime he, sp he speaks extemporaneously, he causes a lot of blunder just like he did with subsidy removal. Go and read the presidential inaugural speech. There was nowhere subsidy removal was put in that speech. Yeah. Remember that. But he spoke extempo at that point, and he announced subsidy removal that said a cascading effect in the market. Secondly, President Tinubu that is telling the tale of subsidy removal, with due respect, has been hypocritical. President Tinubu wrote an op-ed in 2011 and good luck, Jonathan was about to remove subsidy. He was part of those that raised an army of those that went on the street to protest against Absolutely. the same that. subsidy removal. Yeah. If he has forgotten, we remember. So him saying some people over the years have been feeding for true subsidy removal, we should ask him, why did he stop subsidy from going that time? That would have been a better time to remove subsidy. And what plans did he put in place to remove subsidy? He said, Jack Ma will keep training people. And I laughed. And that's why I said, please, President Tudubu should not be allowed to speak extemporaneously. The question I want to ask is, is it a good thing that your best talents are leaving your country because your economy is not conducive for them to thrive? I think he missed the point there about Jack Ma. That's why I said they should be writing this thing down for him. What he should have said is that we will make our economy competitive enough for our best brains to live and stay. Nigerian doctors are going to Syria alone for better opportunities. Just next door. And that's the sad reality he doesn't understand. So you want your economy to be a trading ground. Nobody trains his best talents and want to lose them to a competitor. Yes. Thirdly, he says the state of the economy is good. He knows the state of the economy is bad. This was the same President Inubu that in his major hub, Lagos Island, he was going to the mosque and people were screaming, a big bami. He knows that the state of the economy is at an all-time low in this country. So he saying the state of the economy, and the part that is unforgivable is saying, oh, nothing about those that have been kidnapped. Yes. I know you both have I spoken thought about, you all have when spoken he talked about, about security in Emo, mm -hmm. which has not improved, likely, if you ask people on ground, I thought he was going to buy extension. See, and for those that are facing the scourge of kidnappers, I will work with you. I'll be your president. Right. 
So when you look at all of these things, it's another missed opportunity. And I'd like to ask, I might be wrong, please, I don't know anything. If President Tinubu sees the need to attend Opus Odima's second term inauguration, how many governors' inauguration will they attend in the country? Yeah. Because I don't think it was necessary in the first place. Yeah. They were pertinent issues that could be. A governor should be is a subnational. And for Governor Opus Odima, I think he should be more concerned about how to bring investment and foreign investment to his state. That should be his priority. Yeah. I mean, Rufa, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, talking about him not mentioning the insecurity, even going to visit the victims of that play to massacre and was able to go to this uh, inauguration uh, ceremony speaks a lot. This brings me to my next story, uh, Vimbai. Um, well, in the meantime, former Vice President of Nigeria, Atiku Abubakar, on Monday attributed the cause of the prevailing insecurity in the country to worsening poverty and hunger. In a post on X, Atiku condemned the killing of Nabiha, one of the six sisters abducted in Abuja, and Folonsho Ariyo, another kidnapped victim, describing the incidents as sad and called on the federal government to address the dire security situation in the country. His tweet reads in part, the escalating violence and lawlessness in our nation deeply distresses me as bandits and kidnappers continue their reign of terror unchecked. Our youths and innocent citizens are being murdered daily. Just last Saturday, we lost Nabiha to her captors. Yesterday, the tragedy deepened with the murder of more victims, including Foronsho Ariyo, a 13-year-old student. It is obvious that the worsening poverty and hunger in the land is escalating the level of kidnapping and insecurity in Nigeria, particularly in Abuja, the federal capital territory, when the government fails to fulfill its constitutional obligations of protecting the lives and property of citizens. It is an invitation to kidnappers and other criminal elements to have a free reign visiting houses and hotels in and around the capital city, kidnapping citizens without resistance. This is a sad development, a sad development indeed. Absolutely. Over to you. You know, um, Rufai earlier stated the japa, you know, and reference to it of us glamorizing young people who are escaping, in essence, the economic situation. Let's talk about the security situation. Young people are not just faced with a difficult situation. We look at these reports. I mean, we've, we've delved in this in detail today. And the concern is, why are we minimizing the plight of ordinary people, especially young people? Uh, you know, it, it takes me to some developments that took place in Malawi and Kenya last year, where presidents of both countries decided that they would ship off their young people to work. Malawians were sent off to Gaza to work for $1,000 per month on the farms of Gaza that had been abandoned by farm workers who had, were running away from the war. So you look at, do we need to wait to get to a point where young Nigerians are now escaping to a war zone to look for better opportunities because it feels safer and more secure economically and in terms of physical well-being than the situation in Nigeria? It's not necessary. We need to stop minimizing. So I'm glad that uh, Atiko has spoken truth to power in right. this instance. Uh, I, I feel also they're making his job as an opposition, uh, an opposition uh, party relatively easy in this sense because all he has to do is state the obvious uh, in order for, uh, for, for him to get a little bit more support. However, we really are in a situation where we need to stop minimizing the suffering yeah. of our people. Well, we are thankful for the opposition. I mean, Atiku has been speaking, Peter Obi has been speaking, and it is the way that we can all get a healthy democracy. We'll take another story. Highlighting Ruth Ogunleye, an alleged female soldier who made a video accusing her superiors, whom she identified as Colonel I.B. Abdul Karim, Colonel G.S. Ogo, and Brigadier General I.B. Solebo, of making her life unbearable. Ogunleye holds Colonel I.B. Abdul Karim particularly responsible for the difficulties she has faced in the army, taken to her TikTok account. Ogunleye shared her distressing experience with her superiors. 2022. I was supposed to come to me medical center or job. 
Yeah, I met Connie. I be a booker. Who request sex for me and I refused. Ever since then, this man has been my nightmare in the army. He threatened to dismiss me each time he see me. He injects me. Come to my room to inject me. My own apartment. Come to my room here to inject me. Send some boys to my house. If I'm lying, I have all evidence. I have evidence against him. And I have witnesses. Come to my house to inject me. He also stigmatized that I have meta in his Each time I try to expose him. Or each time any senior person, any senior, uh, any senior officer trying to intervene. He will tell that I have meta in this. He wrote to DOA to abort to board me out. He wrote to DOA three good times to board me out of army. He freeze my account for one year. He freeze my account February last eighteen date. No salary. I've tried to come. I've tried to come. I tried. I cried to some senior officers. I I wrote a petition. This is section one seven nine of the Enforcers Act. I've I've done so. Many, I've seen so many officers, senior officers. Junior officers to intervene, but none of them is giving me this in here. But and anyone who's trying to intervene, he will tell them I have mental illness. The day he locked me, he injected me, he almost raped me. When they caught him and he said I have mental illness, he took me to psychiatry hospital. He went to lock me up there. He locked me up there for one good month without any medication. Well, this is such a sad story, even by Ayo and Rufai. She's mentioned a lot of things. She's cited, you know, mental health issues. I mean, the, her superiors accusing her of being unstable. She also mentioned the fact that, you know, she hasn't gotten her salary in over a year. I think it is very important that I highlighted this story because it came out last week and the Nigerian army has not responded yet. I know that the Minister of Women Affairs, Uju Kennedy Onaheye, has called on the Nigerian army to respond to these allegations. We hope that we hear something from the army. We'll take another story. The Code of Conduct Bureau on Monday says it has commenced an investigation into the alleged breach of the Code of Conduct for public officers by Olubumi Tunjiojo, the Minister of Interior. CCB spokesperson said the minister is expected to appear at the bureau headquarters in Abuja today, January 16th. The bureau says its investigation is hinged on its mandate and powers as enshrined in the third schedule of the 1999 constitution. Their investigation is coming as President Tinubu set up a six-person panel led by the coordinating minister of the economy and minister of finance, Wale Edun, to reposition Nigeria's social investment programs. The president has suspended the programs following the financial scandal in the humanitarian ministry, which supervised them. Tunji Ojo is linked to the scandal after a leaked document showed that New Planet Project Limited, a company founded by the minister, got a whooping 438 million Naira consultancy contract from the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, led by Beta Edu, the suspended Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Elevation. Well, CCB is doing their job at this time. We know that the president has set up that panel to investigate. You know, but there's a lot of conversation regarding uh, this minister at this point, whether or not he should step aside while the investigation is ongoing. I, I mean, Rufai, I don't, I don't know if you can quickly make a statement, so we take our last Real story quickly, on that. I'm happy that CCD, CCB has stepped in. You know why? Because in 2019, when he made his declaration of assuming the position in the National House of Assembly, he made a declaration and he filled the CCB form. It is based on that form, the CCB we need to grill him when he was stating the source of wealth. Did he by any chance say that this company was part of a source of wealth in that declaration form? Secondly, was there a proper resignation for the company before assuming government position? That's another one. So I think it's on the basis of that the CCB has called him in. And they're going to ask him questions as regards that. Right. And we'll wait for them to, to respond to that. All right. Yeah. I just want to quickly read out a statement regarding the female police officer. This is from the army. They wrote, it is crucial to point that contrary to the claims made in the video, the soldier in question has not exhausted the laid down procedure for seeking redress in the Nigerian army. This is aside human rights and gender desks established in army headquarters and across 
Nigerian army formations where complaints about human rights and gender issues are also entertained. I mean, I think it goes beyond just the statement yeah. from the Nigerian army. We need yeah. to hear more investigation as okay. to her claims. We'll take our final story now in the United States, where 22-year-old Madison Marsh became the first active duty Air Force officer to be crowned Miss America. The U.S. Air Force took to social media to congratulate Marsh, who is a second lieutenant in the Air Force and a graduate intern at Harvard Medical School. Marsh beat 50 other contestants to earn the top spot in the 2024 Miss America pageant, which took place on Sunday, January 14th in Florida. Your Miss America 2024 is... Miss Colorado! I mean, this for me was just a huge, huge story. First of all, she's 22. She's in the Air Force. She's like, Have, you're smiling too much, Rufai. This is your spec. I'm recommending her for you. But if you really quickly, we have only 30 seconds. Congratulations. So something she also talked about was also dedicating to her late mom who died of pancreatic cancer. That was such a sweet sport. And just to see her doing what she wants to do and still it. I love it. I love what a man can do, a woman can even do better. I mean, Rufai, you're Charlie, you're angels. What do you make of us now? You guys are too much. Well, all right. I'd like to thank you all, Rufai and his angels, for your great analysis on what's trending today. Well, that's all I have for you on what's trending today. I'll see you all tomorrow.